Good evening. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of The Village Square. On behalf of The Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us tonight for Tim Urban, What's Our Problem? This program is made possible by funding from Florida Humanities through the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's part of a multi-year series of digital programs, UNUM, Democracy Reignited, presented in partnership with Florida Humanities, exploring the past, present, and future of the American idea as it exists on paper, in the hearts of our people, and as it manifests in our lives. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for Humanities. If you're not familiar with the work of NEH or Florida Humanities, we're putting their web addresses in the chat window. Be sure to check them out. The chat window will be closed tonight, but you can ask questions at any time during the program by clicking on the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. If you haven't taken our pre-event survey yet, it'll take just a moment to do so now. Um, we're dropping the link into the chat thread too. Your honest um, answers will help the Village Square with nationally uh, scoped research effort to better understand divisions in the United States. And it is completely confidential. Even if you've done the survey for another program, we ask that you complete it again this time. Uh, we are delighted to welcome streaming partners, Bridge USA. Uh, UC, USC Center for the Political Future, National Institute for Civil Discourse, Listen First Project, Common Ground Committee, Braver Angels, Civic Health Project, McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State, Unify, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other podcast, Citizen Connect, Center for the Humanities at University of Miami, Network for Responsible Public Policy, and our wonderful long-term local partners, Tallahassee Democrat and WFSU Public Media. I also want to give a special shout out to our newest streaming partner, but also one of our oldest and dearest friends, Living Room Conversations. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator back by popular demand, Manu Meal. Manu is a social entrepreneur who is passionate about empowering young people, protests on the campus of UCAL Berkeley over a planned visit by right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos inspired then-freshman Manu Meal to establish what has now become Bridge USA, an organization that aims to promote democracy, not partisanship, and now has 85 college chapters and 35 high school chapters in 39 states. Manu does not sleep. He was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in Education. He's the host of the fabulous podcast, Hopeful Majority, where he's interviewed leaders like Andrew Yang and Ibu Patel. We'll put links in the chat window so you can learn more about both Bridge USA and Hopeful Majority. Manu, how are you tonight? Liz, it's great to see you. And, and I'm so grateful always uh, to be invited back. I don't know if it's popular demand, but I appreciate uh, the events you host, the work you're doing, and to everybody in the back team, thank you. I'm excited. It is for this definitely popular demand. It's funny because you are you are definitely requested, and I do facilitation too, right? So every once in a while, they want you so badly, I kind of go, "Wait, what's wrong with me?" <laughs> well, I appreciate all the work you put into the events, and and I think this one will be an exciting conversation. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited it. to enjoy the conversation. Take it away, Manu. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Liz. Thank you to the Village Square. Thank you to Florida Humanities. Um, I'm really excited, everybody, for this conversation. And as you know, we've seen each other for a couple of these different events. And and here and now I come across a thinker that has been particularly relevant in my shaping and my thinking. And as Liz said, I, I lead an organization called Bridge USA. And this conversation is also being posted on the Hopeful Majority podcast for our audience. And so with that, the thinker that I want to introduce to you today, Tim Urban, is the writer and illustrator and co-founder of Wait But Why. It's a long form stick figure illustrated. Yes, you heard that right. Stick figure illustrated website with over 600,000 subscribers and a monthly average of half a million visitors. Um, Tim has produced dozens of viral articles, many of which I've read from on a variety of topics. And I didn't know this fun fact, Tim, but Apparently, your 2016 TED Talk is the second most watched in the history of TED Talks with 73 million <laughs> views. That's a lot of people procrastinating. And in uh, 2023, to wrap this up, Tim published his best-selling book, What's Our Problem? A self-help book for societies, which is now in the chat. And, and that's going to be the focus of this conversation. So so welcome to the to the, to the the conversation. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for having me. This is, you guys are, I feel like my crew here. I'm always happy to talk to you. 
Well, I, I mean, th this is quite the time to be talking and having a conversation about where we are domestically um, and using your framework. I mean, we're only two weeks away from the election. Uh, and so my thought process for the audience is that we'll, we'll essentially do about 55 minutes of conversation between Tim and I back, for, back and forth. It's gonna be pretty free flowing. And while we're doing that conversation, um, we're gonna do a Q and A at the end uh, from eight o'clock Eastern to eight twenty-five. So if you've got questions, if you've got critiques, if you've got feedback, please note them down. We're gonna we're gonna go through those. Um, so with that, Tim, uh, it seems like the the most relevant and interesting place to start is actually the model that you put forward in in your book, and you draw a distinction between the primitive mind and the higher mind. Um, let's just start there. Can you can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, well, you mentioned my TED Talk, which was um, me explaining what goes on in my head when I procrastinate, which is all the time. And it doesn't make sense. It's, um, why, you know, why am I doing this thing that uh, is so self-defeating? Um, you know, you ask the same question, why do you binge on uh, junk food sometimes when you regret it immediately after and it's, it makes no sense to do that. Uh, and, and I think uh, both of the answers uh, come from the fact that we, our brains are not just kind of like one system that has, it, it's multiple systems in there. And, um, and uh, I, you know, you, I, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I prefer to use funny characters, uh, but yep. uh, you know, I, I, it, in the in the TED talk, I talk about the rational decision maker and the instant gratification monkey, but that that's really specific to kind of how I talk about procrastination. So I wanted to generalize a little bit more, um, uh, and I, you know, the, what they really what the there there's this limbic system part of you, which I call the primitive mind, and it is not a bad part of you. Um, it gives you a lot of your fun in life. We need it. Um, it's just a very ancient part of our brain. It's a it's a part of our brain that hasn't changed much even, you know, in the last, you know, I don't know, 50, 100 million years since since early mammals, you know, had a, probably a limbic system that didn't look that different. Um, and it is programmed. It's a it's 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 programmed for a world uh, that we used to live in, that we evolved in when it when we were when calories were really hard to come by. Yeah. Uh, and if you found them, you should binge on them. And that the was what the program days. said to do. Exactly. So we've been John junk food now because the primitive mind says, oh, my God, look at this dense, you know, these Skittles, this dense fruit we found, eat, eat, you know, eat as much as we can. Uh, procrastination, you know, it wants to conserve energy. It doesn't want it doesn't it can't think long term or big picture. So it doesn't that, that project that's due later. It's not panicked about it right now. So it doesn't want to work right now because when it was programmed, there were no really long term projects like that. You, you you got food when you were hungry and you conserved energy when you could and you ran away from the tiger that was running at you. If I don't know if they if ancient humans interact with tigers that much, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And so this is uh, this is this is one character that's in our brain. And then there's this other character. This is what separates us from the other animals because they all have primitive minds. But we have this, you know, pretty giant neocortex that's this much yeah. more advanced much newer part of our brain that's very human you know we have it more than any other animal much more a higher percentage of it. and uh this is the part that can see the world we're actually in and say wait a second we're not in 50,000 BC uh calories aren't hard to come by there are long-term projects that I should work on for because I'm in an advanced civilization and I have a career and I'm not just trying to you know hunt and gather for food um, and so that voice wants to do whatever makes sense. Uh, sometimes that is doing stuff that the primitive mind likes, um, you know, when you're having a good meal or when it's time to go to bed or when you're enjoying your well and leisure time, uh, you know, they agree, but so much of the time in this society, which is really different than the society we evolved into. So it's kind of like we've been kidnapped from our home planet in a way, which is kind of an ancient tribe somewhere in the Savannah. And we've been planted into this new planet, which is an advanced civilization. And the programming is often misfiring and mis, you know, mistaking one thing, a healthy thing for an unhealthy thing or vice versa. Um, and so there's this conflict. And I think that uh, this comes up in all kinds of ways. Um, so as I just mentioned a few, but of course, in the area we're going to talk about, uh, I think this has a lot to do with how we form our beliefs about stuff like politics or religion. I think those two minds have a lot to say about that, and they say very different things. 
Yeah, we're going to get to to the word that you just said, politics, because I know a lot of the audience knows the village square and this work in that context of red, blue, Republican, Democrat. But but that's going to pause for a quick second. It's like putting the primitive mind on break. Right. And and mm-hmm. saying, all right, let's let's go to some some high rung thinking, if you will. So it, one of the takeaways that I got from when you're thinking about applying the primitive versus high mind, it, higher mind is that the primitive mind focuses on confirming what you already know. It's about confirming your worldview, whereas the higher mind seems to be one that focuses much more on sort of just the search for truth, right? Um, and a lot of your work is anchored in this assumption that we're built for this world that we're currently not necessarily meant to adapt towards. So how do you think, just with the pace of technological change, how do you think humans are keeping up? And how do you think this constant pace of technology has impacted sort of just the way in which we think and, and operate? Well, one, you know, kind of obvious area is, you know, if you went, uh, you know, certainly 50,000 years ago, but also 10,000 years ago, and also kind of like 300 years ago, you're living in a world that just didn't change that much. Your great grandparents lived a life very similar to the life you're going to live with a lot of the, the same kind of, you know, the same values made sense and the same thinking served you in both lives and your great grandchildren would probably live again, similar kinds of lives. And in a world like that, conventional wisdom is wise. It actually um, is based on decades and generations of trial and error. And, you know, when your grandmother says, don't eat that berry, don't eat the berry because she learned that the hard way or someone learned that the hard way way down and they've passed that along. So conventional wisdom is a collection of all of our learnings. And it's a, it's a great, you know, guide for how to live in the world that we live in, you know, you can leverage all of this collective knowledge that's built up, that's kind of accumulated. And again, that's, that was always the case. So our brains are very wired for that world. And to, so, so we have this instinct to trust conventional wisdom. It must, if everyone's saying something, it must be true. Uh, You know, uh, and if I have, if I disagree with what what people around me say, I must be wrong because conventional Mm -hmm. wisdom clearly knows better. And actually today, um, we live in a totally different world. We live in a world where the world changes, not just from generation to generation, but decade to decade, year to year. And so, of course, this is a this is a point that applies to business and 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 the arts and um, all kinds of anything that involves any kind of strategy or just how to live your best life. You know, lifestyle choices. Um, we are programmed to kind of follow what is normal, but often what is normal is is based on conventional wisdom that's lagging like ten or twenty or fifty years behind reality. And again, the primitive mind doesn't understand that. The primitive mind wants to follow, wants to fit in, wants to, you know, assuming everyone else must be right. Well, the, the, what I call the higher mind, this other part of the brain, um, actually is really good at looking at the present and assessing it and, and saying, you know, does this actually make sense? Um, and maybe everyone else is wrong. And, but the primitive mind hates that idea. It feels very scary and very, you know, it's very hard to have confidence in yourself because we're programmed not to, we're programmed to trust the the collective. So I think that's an, an example of how, like, um, just the way we form our beliefs, we can't really trust our instincts that well, because those instincts really don't serve us in a world that's totally different. So you start to introduce this concept of the latter, right? And And it actually goes exactly to, I think, what you just said, which is, the way in which we form our beliefs is what's actually differentiating us. Um, can you explain a little bit about this thinking ladder and how it relates to the primitive mind and the higher mind? Because I think that's going to help the audience track to sort of the next level of this conversation, which is, okay, let's now apply this to sort of our political divisions. Right. So so the the the, the, the core idea with the ladder is it's a, it's a spectrum because it's not that, you know, oh, my higher mind is doing the thinking right now. My primitive mind is nowhere to be found or vice versa. It's not like that. There's you're usually in the middle somewhere. You know, you're not usually you're 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 arguing with yourself about whether you should have that brownie, that second brownie. And, you know, and it's not that it's so obvious. It's that usually there's a, conf- a conflict going on. So the way I could like to think about it is it's a spectrum where maybe on, on one end of the spectrum, what I would call the bottom of the ladder, your primitive mind is fully kind of in charge and you're really not thinking very hard. And that's when you later look and you go, 
what was I thinking? Why was I doing that? You know, why did I have that angry outburst that made no sense? I feel so embarrassed and bad about that now. That's, that wasn't me, right? That wasn't me. That that kind of, so that does happen to us. Um, and then at the very top of the ladder is the opposite. You know, you're just in a perfectly rational, high-minded zone. You're feeling really like a grown up. You're really in charge of how you're being. And that's great. But usually we're somewhere in the middle. So uh, I, I made it kind of a four rung ladder where, you know, the top rung. And, and you're just very... for Liz, could we put up figure two as, as Tim goes through this? Because I think it'll help the audience track it. Go for it, Tim. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so at the, at the the yeah, you can see here. So these are my very, very poor stick. These are the stick figures. I, I try my best <laughs> on and they're not They're They're, you know, Whatever. So, um, so here, you know, we talked about Skittles, right? You know, there's, 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 is, you know, there, when there's a conflict, uh, you're either, you have to choose between the orange and the green zone, right? It's, you can't make both of them happy. And when you're, you know, when you're choose the green zone, it's when you're doing something that makes no sense. So the ladder, you know, you can see at the top of the ladder is the little higher mind figure. Um, that's, that's how I illustrate the higher mind. And the bottom, you have this primitive mind, this little orange guy with a flame, you know, it's this fi primal fires of, you know, your primal fires. And the higher mind has the staff because it's kind of like your higher light. It's this, it's this wisdom uh, part of you. And the, the latter is a spectrum. So I, I, on the top rung is when you really are, you know, you can see here, the higher mind has the primitive mind on the, on a leash, like a pet, which is the healthiest way we can be. It's that, you know, you, you hear its voice and it says, well, I want that brownie. And you say, no, not now. We're not doing that right now. And it's a well-trained, you know, animal and, and you're in charge. Right. Um, uh, and, uh, but then you go down a little bit and um, the, 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 the smoke from that flame gets a little bit you know, it kind of riles up, the flame gets brighter and you feel it more and the smoke starts to cloud your consciousness a little bit. That light from the higher mind isn't as, you know, clear. And you're still in, you know, the second rung, the higher mind still has the edge. You're going to make the right decision, but it's a huge struggle and you might only make it part, part of the way. And you're kind of, you know, it's hard. It's much harder to have discipline. And then on the third rung, it's also a conflicted place, but this is when the, the powers flip. Now that the, the primitive mind is making the decisions and there's a huge resistance to that, but it is, you do lose the battle. And then on the bottom rung are those moments that I talked about when the higher mind is just large and in charge. You can't even, you, there's so much smoke in your mind. You are so consumed with, you know, so again, there's so many different ways to be consumed. Um, uh, it can be lust. It can be tribal, you know, hatred. It can be, you know, just ravenous hunger, whatever it is. Something is just, you're not, you're not, you're being yourself. You just have no control over yourself. And, you, you know, and later you look and you say, what was I thinking? So that's, th those to me are like the four rungs. And, you, you know, when you talked about forming your beliefs. So, I talked about diet or procrastination and these ways that 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 the, this ladder can apply. This ladder can apply to all kinds of human struggles. You know, the kind where you self defeat. Uh, the, the what I focused on in in this book that I think we're going to talk more about today is how this ladder applies to thinking, to our beliefs, to you know what we believe to be true about the world, about what's right and wrong, our moral beliefs. Um, and I think that the higher mind has a pretty clear motive here. Um, it just wants to do what makes sense, which is I want to have correct beliefs. I want to be accurate. I want to know what's true. And it also knows that truth is hard. You, you know, it's had enough experience to know that that world is endlessly nuanced and complex and that you don't always have all the information and that, you know, they, the, the right answer is, I don't know to many things, but that we're going to search for truth. So it has this humility about it, but also this confidence that it can learn and this integrity. So this is great. If we all thought like that, the world would be an amazing place. But of course we have the other character. In our and, and just to clarify, that's yeah. for the higher mind is that's the higher mind integrity, the search of truth, looking through evidence not confirming, but sort of focused on trying to sort through information. Yeah, it's the same part of your brain that wants to uh, eat, eat healthier, that wants right. to exercise, that wants to um, uh, that wants to do your work when you should be doing it and not procrastinate. It's just logic. It just makes sense. It's not rocket science. It's just basic logic, grown up behavior. But the reason we all have a hard time with this, whether we're grownups or not, um, is that this, this primitive mind thinks totally differently. And when it comes to how we form our beliefs, what it wants, this limbic system wants to feel right, wants to be have conviction about your beliefs and really about your your you know beliefs of the you know of us, the people like us. We believe these things, and that's correct. And I don't even need to research because it's so obvious that it's correct, and it it sees your beliefs like as sacred objects that are almost a part of you. So when, you know, if someone challenges those beliefs, it feels like it's a physical threat and it just wants to confirm those beliefs. It wants to 
taking information that confirms the beliefs and it just rejects the information that doesn't, which of course is the opposite of how you would find truth. The higher mind wants to take in all kinds of views, especially ones that conflict with your your mental model because you want to see well where am i wrong let's let's test this thing so we're not we don't think like either of those we think like a combo of those and on your best days you're really at the top of the ladder where you're really focused on truth and you're you're humble and you have integrity about what you know and you don't know and you say i don't i don't know a lot and as you move down the ladder, you start to feel attached for, to certain beliefs. You start, you want, you know, you know, this is a debate, but you really want this side to be true. And by the time you're at the bottom, you can't even conceive of ever being wrong. Of course, I'm right about this. Of course, we're right about this. And the people who disagree with us are terrible and awful and wrong. So that is the battle going on in our heads intellectually. Uh, and it comes up in all kinds of areas. So uh, just to take a quick step back, because I can imagine folks saying this makes a ton of sense, right? The the way that the ladder operates, this distinction between the primitive mind and the higher mind. Um, but Tim, for a quick sec, why are you even focused on coming up with this model? Like what what's the point of all of this? Just like if you took a step back, like why is this what you focus your time on? Why is this the stick figures that you wanted to draw? Give us some of the significance behind the model. Yeah, I didn't start here. I started with the question that, you know, is the title of my book, what's our problem? Why is everyone hate each other? Why is truth so like in such a dark age? You know, why are we um, acting like children on social media at our dinner parties? Um, you know, when do, it feels like our society was getting younger and more immature every year. And that's supposed to go the other way, right? We're supposed to be wiser. You're supposed to look back at people in the, you know, we look back at people in the 1930s and we look at you know their racism and we say oh they're so unwise and they were you know they they didn't you know now we're so much better and we are but then in all these other areas it was going the wrong direction and i was like what is going on and that's when i started to say okay i i you know and again we, we get into politics in a minute but like it, it to me it wasn't um the, what but the, the discussions were all about you know which is the bigger problem the right or the left the red or the blue team you know and that's and I said, I don't think that is the where the, the, the answer lies here. I don't think I think that there's another axis that we need to that 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 you know people whether they're on the right or the left. I see certain people who are truth focused and who have integrity and who are nuanced and who are being productive about this, and I see other people who are just making things worse and they're not serving the the, the causes they claim to be serving. They're they're hurting their own causes and they're making everything worse. And I see that I do see that on both sides, and so. I said, look, what, what is this axis? What, what is actually going on? And that's when I started thinking about, okay, what is, because I, I, and I know this because I've been on both of those people. I've been in, in crazy tribal zone. I've been higher minded. And, and what is going on? Just like I did with procrastination. I said, what is going on in my own head? I started there and I kind of said, okay, I think this is actually a lot like procrastination. I think that these two characters, we form, they form beliefs totally differently. And I think that the vertical axis is defined by that. And I think that the, the, the problem isn't, you know, on, on the, the horizontal, the problem is this this low rung kind of thinking and how it's and the horizontal worse. being left right. The, the left horizontal right. in this case, you know, again, you can apply it to case. any set of beliefs. You could go to a country that's having religious turmoil and talk about their horizontal. The horizontal is just the what you think axis. Hmm. So it can be about religion, politics, anything else, science. You know, scientists get really low rung about defending their theories, or they become, or they're truth focused. You know, it's a, um, and uh, and and politics. When I when we, you know, it's all the entire discussion is a horizontal discussion about left, center, right, far right, far left, right. Those are all horizontal words. Those are all what you think words, and that's great. We need to talk about that. I'm glad we have that axis. It's a useful tool, but it was missing the the, the how you think axis. And so I said we need a how you think axis because this is this is the first. This is the the, the limiting factor here. We need to we need to all be better. We need to figure out what's going on in the how you think axis. Then we can get back to the what you think axis. So that's the latter is the how you think axis in this case. So for anybody listening to this right now, and you've got a question, drop that question in the chat because we want to get to a lot of those. It would be very odd of us at talking about high rung thinking if we did get to some of those questions. And so please, please, please drop those questions. So I I, I wanna I wanna share something with you, which is so interesting. So when you started when when I first saw your graphic about the y axis that let's let's forget about the left at least in the context of politics right let's forget about the left right divide for a second and let's realize that there's actually an, another divide and that divide is between how you think around that time we were coming up with similar concept because we I I was seeing something on campuses Tim and and of course we work in colleges and high schools and it was this interesting thing where yes people are very divided but 
we kind of saw this new divide and that divide was not between, you know, the Republican students and the Democrat students. I mean, that's always existed. The real divide that we saw was between like the silent majority of people that kind of have that, you know, high rung thinker, at least we're kind of interested in it. Right. And the vocal minority of people that were super loud and, and highly focused on sort of that low rung thinking. And, and we're, I was trying to figure out like, how do you explain this, this divide between the silent majority and this vocal minority? Um, do you see that playing across the board? And is, is, is that something that you've seen across your work as you try to explain the difference between high rung thinking and low rung thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I saw the same thing on campuses. I said, this is a vertical issue we are having here on campuses. And it's not that the problem is not that there is low rung thinking on campus. There always will be any group of people. You're always going to have any country. You're going to have these pockets of of low rung thinking. The problem is that there's supposed to be a pervasive high rung culture across campus. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you go to Harvard and you go through the gates, what do they say at the very, you know, the seal at the, at the, in the, in the front gate says Veritas, right? That to me is, you know, if you go to a church, what are you going to see? You're going to see crosses because the the kind of the telos of the church is to serve Christ and then to worship Christ. Right. And so the cross is everywhere to remind you, this is what we're here for. The Veritas is their cross, right? Veritas is the telos of a university. It is true. It is truth. Veritas means truth, right? It is that that's the anchor. That's the North star. And the only way you have truth is if you can, you say, you can go be low rung if you want. And you're thinking you can also find a group of people and be low rung together. But people here who want to be high rung, who want to debate and disagree and say things that are controversial or unpopular and test ideas and play devil's advocate and explore, you know, where we might be wrong and all that kind of high rung stuff, they need to be free to do so. And the Veritas seal is a reminder that this is a high rung place. If you want to go be low rung, do it, but you don't, can't bother anyone else. And that's how it's supposed to be. Now, the problem on campuses, again, isn't that there's low-rung thinking. It's that over the last, you know, maybe decade, but especially in the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, um, a bad trend has happened, which is that the low-rung components of campus, the low-rung mentality has not just done its own thing and minded its own business. It has started to enforce itself across the whole campus. And so you'll have you know, one ideology that gets powerful enough to, you know, to say, okay, you know, without taking the actual Veritas plaque down, essentially crossing out Veritas and saying, you know, our ideology. And that is now, this is the, the new telos. And people who disagree with our ideology, they're going to be punished, which is that, that right. Once, once that starts to happen, the entire high rung mechanism, which is amazing, collective intelligence emerges from that, you know, disappears. And the the majority, if the high rung people are being silent, it's because the culture has been kind of hijacked. And so that culture that's supposed to say, oh, no, 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 you do not try to censor people on campus. You do not bully people on campus. You can do your own thing and you can choose to, you know, be like that, but you can't first, that has failed. That's like kind of the high rung immune system that campuses are supposed to have. It's like the immune system failed and the virus of low rungness instead of being contained to these pockets, spread over the entire campus. And once that happens, it doesn't mean that you're a coward or a weak person now if you don't speak up. You don't want to lose your job. You don't want to have, you know, and so you get, it becomes this, this is something that humans do. It it becomes very scary to speak up and to defy now these kind of people who are acting like the mafia. And if you do defy them, you're going to get ostracized. You might get sanctioned and punished and smeared. uh, And no one's going to stand up for you because they don't want to be the next one. It's very kind of, you know, smear campaign, scary kind of McCarthy's red scare type behavior. Humans do this. Look at every, you know, part of history. You can see this. Well, it's happening. It was, it was happening and it's still happening on campuses. Mm-hmm. So there's I have a term for that, that, by the way. I, I just which is, finish you want, that. Yeah, one yeah, you want to bring that out? Yeah. yeah. The, the term I use is idea supremacy. Cause I was like, what is really going on? And it's, and I think there's um, if you can pull up like slide five. Um, and we're, slide and five, for those of you that, those of you that are listening to this, uh, but are not watching, that's, we'll also post this on YouTube so you can catch the figures. Yeah. And it, I'll describe it five. anyway, but the, the, 
so, so idea of supremacy is the idea that, uh, one more, yeah. And just a little scroll, there we go. Um, so, okay, so this is a, you know, the, the, I, I, I realize here that it's like, again, as I said, the, the problem wasn't low rungness, it was certain kind of low rungness. So the, the, the low runger on the left here, what I call the non-authoritarian non low runger, that's the person I have no problem with. They're, they're inevitable and they mind their own business and you can form a little you know, echo chamber amongst your friends and you're not hurting anyone. <laughs> you know, you're hurting yourself. You're not gonna learn very much, but you're not hurting anyone else, so it's fine. Um, then there's the, the, you know, the, the kind of the middle ground where you, someone who says, not only am I not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go listen to an idea I disagree with, but I'm gonna actually not be friends with anyone who does. And so they're gonna force their friends to make a decision. Like, am I gonna, you know, be in fully in this kind of echo chamber or am I gonna not be friends? And you know what, that's, I don't admire that kind of person. I don't think that, uh, I think they need to grow up, but they're also okay. That's not the, the problem because you can choose not to be friends with them. And so the campus is still free. Veritas is still alive and well. It's this third one. It's this third one that says, you know, if, if, if a speaker wants to come to campus and do a talk, not only am I not gonna go, not only am I gonna get mad at my friends if they go and not be friends with anyone who does go, but I'm gonna shut the talk down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually get the talk canceled or I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna scream so loud in the back of the audience that no one will be able to hear and they have to shut it down. That is now Veritas has just disappeared just disappeared. That's a very, it's a, it's a concrete, very specific, distinct difference. Um, and it, it is that behavior that didn't use, to, I, I, you know, I was in college in the early 2000s and it was a tribal place, but it didn't have idea supremacy. All kinds of ideas were all floating around. It made people furious, but it went around, but the ideas, you know, they went around and I learned so much from it. And in the last few years, that has really changed where the, they, they, the, the echo chambers have been succeeding at enforcing their echo chamber culture on the whole campus and that so that's the problem idea supremacy and and for for the audience's context the reason why we're focusing on the college campus for a quick second is because that's it seems like tim one of the institutions you're seeing idea supremacy reigning but for anybody that's in their local community they've seen this phenomenon is that correct that you're seeing sort of this specific challenge of of putting the north star as the ideology and then basically using cudgel to silence people do you, do you see that in other places as well or is that primarily the college campus well you know what happens in college campuses is often a kind of a little uh you know prelude to what's about to happen in the rest of society you know i i, I was one of the first thousand people on facebook because it was a college phenomenon originally and then it spread to other colleges and then it spread everywhere you were one of the first thousand I was because I was you're like a senior a, you're like a, at Harvard when Mark Zuckerberg was a sophomore and he started you're like a Facebook human history collectible. I know it was it was I could not believe the rise of Facebook. I said, really? Like this guy's, you know, Harvard procrastination site he made is like I'd go to like a foreign country and the Internet cafe and I'd see people on it. I'm like, wow, you know, now, of course, it seems like so obvious that it but it wasn't. It was crazy. Anyway, side topic. But, you know, same concept here. This stuff, the, the, the problem that we're having in the country, a, a huge component of it did start on campuses. And it, it, it kind of built there over a longer period of time and then really kind of exploded. And not just campuses, but K through 12 schools too. It started amongst, you know, the education system. And, you know, I don't even think it was an organic student thing. I think that actually a lot, in a lot of cases, you know, students were kind of trained to think this way by older people and also, you know, social media, we can talk about reasons, but campuses, it happened first. And then it started spreading. You started seeing it in companies. You started seeing it all in every industry. You started seeing it and you started seeing this culture just kind of prevail. And this was, you know, suddenly if you, you know, someone disagrees with whoever the most powerful cultural group in any arena, they're going to be punished for it. And that disagreement started to be seen not as something annoying or something to refute or something ideally if you're in a high rungs interesting disagreement started to be seen as dangerous and harmful and if you're disagreeing you need to be punished and and, and kicked out because uh you are doing something dangerous and that that mm -hmm. is a classic you know trick of the low rung mind is to to justify the bullying behavior by saying i'm not bullying i'm just doing self defense and i'm defending others um which of course uh, is not true so let's let's actually drill down on this because i can hear someone in the audience sitting they're listening to our conversation saying, I'm being told that we live in one of the most consequential elections in the history of humanity. And 
the other side, whoever that might be, is is not only fundamentally bad, but in some cases evil, right? And and I get this question from students a lot. If if you grant me that the other side is actually evil, am I not justified in low rung thinking? How do you navigate that? I mean, I think that if, if um, my mindset, if if we've convinced people that we live at a time where the other side is fundamentally mutually exclusive, right? Um, and I'm not talking even political terms. I just mean in general on either side of an argument. Yeah. How do you reconcile that? Well, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, how did the Nazis do what they did? They convinced, they convinced people and themselves that their enemies were subhuman, were... You know, they didn't, the Nazis didn't talk about the Jews like they were, they, they talked about them there like they were disgusting vermin. But that, the, the, the subtext was, they're very powerful. They're running, the, they're pulling the strings of our society. They are the problem. They're evil. They're, 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 they're you know. They're, so I would point to, and I could point to 20, 50 more examples of this. If you're starting to think that half of your country and the people that disagree with you are fundamentally evil to the point where you will violate like all the core kind of American principles or, or your campus Veritas principles, Maybe, you know, you, you know, you should reconsider what's going on. Uh, so I, I think that um, I think that, of course, there is evil in the world. Um, but the idea that that suddenly we've reached a place where um, that the, the, your opponents have become so evil that even allowing them to speak, even the dis, even any form of disagreement, any form of debate is dangerous. All I can say is that, you know, you sound a lot like all of the, you know, murderous dictatorships of the past and the and the genocidal movements. And you sound like that that is what they sound like. So it's again, if, and if there is an element of the other side that is acting evil, even more the reason in bear, you know, put, put that concept naked in the arena of ideas, write about it, talk about it. When people disagree with you, listen to them. If they make a good point, you might need to reconsider. If they if if, if they're wrong and misguided, Thank God that you they were in a safe, felt safe enough to speak out because now you can correct them. If you say that anyone who even disagrees with me must be evil and they need to be punished, nothing you're not going to convince anyone of anything. You're not going to get anything accomplished. So shutting down speech is never the answer. It's just never the answer, and that's you know that's it's uh, it's it's just such a lesson that history teaches us. So I, that, that's that's I guess all I would say to that. It doesn't mean that you. I'm not saying oh the other side has is good and right too. I mean I, I, they they might be genuinely really really wrong at certain times, uh, and they might be doing things that are really harmful. But the answer is an idea supremacy because then you're no different than any. Because you know what you're saying when you do idea supremacy. Here's what you're saying: I have the power to do idea supremacy right now because I have I have cultural power in this moment. So my side can punish the other side. And the other side can't punish us for disagreeing. Because that's the only, only the only the, the culturally powerful can pull off idea supremacy. You're setting a precedent, which instead of saying, look, no one's ever allowed to bully anyone else out of speaking. You're setting a precedent which says, whoever the most powerful cultural group is, is allowed to be the arbiter of what's okay to say and what's not and who's evil and who's not and who can speak and who's not. And that's all well and good while you're in power, but you're not going to always be because the culture is fickle and switches and shifts. And so that's not a precedent you want to set. You're going to end up in a country that nobody wants to live in. So we've talked a lot about individual dynamics, how we show up as people. Um, how do you think about group dynamics? You've got this frame framework similarly to the high uh, to the higher mind and the primitive mind. You deploy the words golems and genies. Um, can you dive into that a little bit? And as you dive into that, I have a question that might sound pesky, but I'll ask it after your answer as a as a response to the question that we just went through, which is, you know, even if ideas that you disagree with might be inherently bad, the solution is actually more speech and more dialogue. But go go to the group dynamics for a quick second. Okay. Sort of the Gollum and Genie framework. So we are a very social species. Like it, it, we are one of the most social species in animal history. Um, our minds are so influenced by group dynamics and it is so human to kind of group think together or to find people that think the same and just kind of form an intellectual culture together. Um, and so when I come back to the latter here, high rung thinking, you know, we talked about it as an individual thing you know, how you think, but 
if you notice, if you think about a group of friends, of, you know, a text thread you're on or your family when they're together over Thanksgiving or you're, you and your spouse or your friend, when you're just the two of you are alone, every group, small to big, has an intellectual culture and, is, and that culture is somewhere on the ladder. So if the culture is higher up on the ladder, you and your friends, uh, what that means is it's cool to disagree. It's cool to say, I don't know. I don't know makes you sound smart in that culture. People respect you for saying that. And disagreement is fun. People get bored if they're agreeing too much. And no one takes it personally when you say you're wrong. They say, you're just arguing with my idea, which is fine. I, help me, make it better. Or I think you're wrong. Let's, let's, like, let's have our ideas fight, right? That's a high rung culture. And in that culture, it's a lot easier to, to stay on the high rungs yourself because the culture is like a magnet kind of pulling you up because you want to, you know, we want to be a good member of whatever culture we're in. Now, when the culture goes to the bottom, and you just say you and your spouse, you know, I can never, don't ever disagree with my spouse about politics. You are in the low rung kind of culture. So the high rung kind of culture I call an idea lab, right? That's an, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's like a science lab, right? Ideas are experiments. The, the people in them are experimenters. We like to kick each other's experiments and try to break them and tinker with them. And no one's taking it personally. Uh, and what you're trying to do as a good scientist, you're trying to get your make your machine is better and better, your little experiment better and, and, and better, right? Like if you're trying to cure cancer, you want people to point out where you're going wrong so you can get better, right? You're looking for truth. If you get to the low rungs, I, it's a, the, the, the culture there, I call it, you know, an echo chamber, which of course is not my term. It's a well-known term. Um, and the echo chamber just has the opposite values intellectual value. So in an echo chamber, if you're in a cu culture where it's very echo chambery about a certain topic or a certain set of topics, you know that disagreeing with the sacred ideas, there's no longer, these are no longer science experiments. These are sacred objects. Disagreeing with the group's sacred beliefs, you will have a, you will get mocked at best, maybe at, at, kicked out of the group at worst. Um, mm -hmm. You will be seen as a terrible and stupid person. People will talk behind your back about what happened to them. It's such a, oh God, you know, and and there's so much social pressure to not do that, to agree. It's a culture of agreement. And you'll just find that people will sit at dinner for three hours and the entire time they'll just talk in different words, how right we are and how wrong the bad guys are and how good we are and how bad those people are. And that's it. Three hours, they'll just be that. That's an echo chamber. And it's not that I'm not criticizing those people because I've been in them. I'm in some of them right now where I know this is a kind of echo chambery vibe here. I'm going to have to. So the, 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 the culture, when it's low rung, it, it not only polices all high rung discussion, it makes sure, you know, silences it like we talked about campuses. Um, it also. It's contagious. It makes us all think everyone in the group, when you're in that group too long, you start to think more low rung. You become really bitter at the other side. You dehumanize them and you start to, you know, think that they're, they're all evil and stupid. And you start to be this childish thinker. You know, it's like you're a better thinker than that. You're a nuanced thinker. You know that. And suddenly you're being this childish thinker who is so sure you're right. You don't even need evidence. You just know you're right. And everyone who disagrees with you is an awful moron. Oh, you, you've slipped into it. Right. And we've all done this. So. There's high rung, you know, thinking and low rung thinking. There's also high rung culture and low rung culture. Now you asked about genies and golems, and the way I, um, the 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 the, the what those are, the emergent properties of these two cultures. So the high rung culture is amazing, not just because it's interesting to be part of and fun and good for you. You learn a lot and you're encouraged to think, and you get your ideas challenged. It's good for us and it's fun to be in. It's interesting to be in. It also has this emergent property where the group itself will form this kind of collective intelligence. So science is the ultimate example of this. Science is a classic idea lab, the, the culture of science, which is, you know, we're searching for truth. We come up with hypotheses. We try to prove them wrong. If we can't, then it's a theory. If other someone else proves it wrong, then we move on and we, we, we try to, you know, and, and we're always trying to be a little bit less wrong. And what happens is all the individual brains in a science institution become neurons in a larger super brain. Uh, and they're all saying what they really think and they're putting out you know, their ind independent thought and they, they, their brains kind of connect together into this super intelligence that is why we have, why we've you know, uh, cured infectious diseases and why we know how far away the gal different galaxies are and why you can go on and on and on and on. Every single scientific epiphany we've had comes from this. No one human is good enough to come up with that. They're all standing on the shoulders of giants and doing this collaborative thinking. So I call that a genie. It's this kind of hovering being that hovers above um, an idea lab 
uh, a group with idea lab culture and, and, it, and, it, and it, it's smarter than any one of the people in the group. It, people putting their heads together becomes mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, a net positive. So and, and just to be clear, and importantly, yeah. I think there's a really fascinating distinction that the culture of an idea lab is not one any single ideology, right? This goes back to, again, there being a y-axis on the left-right division, um, that the culture of the idea lab, the endpoint, the telos, as you said, is actually just the culture of disagreement itself. It's how we think. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Idea lab culture, that's a great point. Idea lab culture is, it's if, if, if there was a constitution on the wall of an idea lab, it would talk about how we think. That, that truth comes first, that all ideas can be debated, no idea is sacred, that, you know, evidence, you need evidence to have strong opinions. If you have conviction in your voice, you better have back that up. Uh, you know, humility is a value. All that, that's, that's all how you think stuff. And then, of course, what you get when you have that constitution is a lot of people discovering true things. You learn a lot and you actually do figure out a lot of stuff. The echo chamber's constitution is all about what we think. The echo chamber's constitution says, here are the correct political stances on every single issue or religious stances or anything else. Here is what is correct. It's a what you think list. And it is the sacred list. And how you think is totally irrelevant. Whether you got to your conviction about point number three through research or just because you know obviously we're right about that, doesn't matter. What matters is that you have the right opinion, that you're the right place on the x-axis. You're the right place on the how you, what you think access. We don't care how you think. In the idea lab, people can, it's like ice skating, a, a back and forth on the axis. You can be anywhere on that. Just stay up high. Stay up high on the how you think axis. So the, you know, and, and, and I, so I, I talked about the idea lab's emergent property is this super intelligent genie that, again, is why we've built this incredible society that no one human could ever do. The echo chamber also has an emergent property. When everyone has a sacred set of beliefs, it's not just that, it's that we, it's, it's a culture of conformity. It's a culture where what matters is, you know, what we, we all agree. And remember, why does the primitive mind hmm. want Skittles? Because in 50,000 BC, dense, sweet things helped you survive, if you found that. Why does the primitive mind want to have this conformity? Because in 50,000 BC, a tribe that said, we are right, we are good, we are perfectly righteous, and they're evil and subhuman they survived and killed a lot of the other people. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a great, it, it, so it, what happens is the emergent property of an echo chamber is also a big giant, but it's not a, it's not a, an intelligent genie. It is a powerful, scary, I kind of call it a, a golem, like the, a big monster, a big kind of stupid, unthinking, but scary monster. You know, as I bring the Nazis back, you know, the Nazis were a big, scary golem, right? You know, you can just, the, uh, uh, the and uh, no one in the Nazis, you know, it wasn't popular there to say, maybe we're wrong about stuff. It was, you know, we are right. And uh, we all agree. And so that that is, but, but of course we all do this. When, when you and your friends all better say the right things politically, and you know, it would go over really bad really bad. If you'd said, I think we're wrong about this. I think the other side is right. What you are is you're being pressured by the, this big golem to be a good organ in the body. What are you doing? You're, you're hurting the, our power because it's a culture of conformity. And that's the conformity is what glues that thing together. Um, that glues that giant together. So you have these two giants. When I look out in the world, I see these two giants kind of in, interfacing with each other on campuses to bring that back. You could to, to use these terms now, what is healthy is when you have echo chambers on campus policed as in, in kind of a policed by the culture into their own little bubbles. So you can have these golems there, but they, they can't hurt you if you don't want to be in them. So the genies thrive and the whole campus becomes a big genie. And the problem is that the high rung immune systems failed. The, 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 the fence around, you know, uh, the most powerful golem hmm. fell down. And this monster started tramping through campus and everyone started screaming and running for cover. And now it's standing in the middle of campus and everyone is saying, I, you know, is terrified. Do not say anything that's going to hurt that golem. And that, of course, is imagine what that does to the poor students who are there to try to learn and become better thinkers. And we can go into that more. But yeah. Is there is there ever a time in the spirit of us being an idea lab? Is there ever a time where primitive thinking, low run thinking actually makes sense in our modern society? I think it, it it's great when you're loving your kid. You know, to have unconditional love for your child um, and to think your child is beautiful, no matter what they look like. And to, you know, there, th that is the limbic system, you know, doing its thing. And it's beautiful. 
And I, I think it's great, right? Uh, there's a, I think there's a lot of times when um, primitive thinking is helpful. I think when you form your beliefs, it, it's going to make you dumb. So the question is, is there a time when conformity and strength is more important than being right? And one, one area I could say is if you don't have a strong enough, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of times when you had no choice, when there's one country that's attacking another country. And if this, and, and if you, if you're being invaded and you don't win, you will all die regardless of what rung you're thinking on. So, and, and if you're in a war now, this is primitive stuff, right? We're in the primitive minds territory now, right? You know, you know, dehumanizing the other side and trying to, to the point where you can kill them without guilt um, and dying for your flag and you will fight, you know, under your flag, you know, and, and that, and that, you know, that is an extremely primitive environment, but sometimes it's necessary because the alternative is you, you all get killed. Um, so yeah, I think un unfortunately there are times because we live in a world of humans and, you know, it's not that advanced, you know, we're still kind of maybe in a hundred years, we, this won't be a thing, but we still, we live in a world of humans. Sometimes golems are necessary, but not usually, and not in the U S usually, I think that it, when you see it in the U S today, what it is, is it's a remnant of, a, of it, it is, it is that the necessity that, that used to be there to form this thing, rearing its head in a place where we don't need it. And it's, but it, but it's our instinct to do it. And so you have these golems tramping around acting like we're in a society where you need to be conformist and just crush the other side. And that's not necessary. So there, there's a really fascinating point there, which is this idea that the golem is standing in the middle of campus while everyone else is running away, which sort of assumes right, implicitly at least, or at least this is what I'm reading into it, that we live at a time where most people generally are interested in the idea of being open-minded. Most people want to be listened to. Most people are open to the concept of high-rung thinking. And yet, the golem still persists. Um, why is it that the culture of the golem, the culture of low-rung thinking, is so loud at this moment? It feels like it's everywhere. And this actually links into a thread of some of the questions that we're already getting. So let, let's actually, let's just oversimplify a little bit and divide campus, people on campus into four groups when it comes to like, you know, genie versus golem type thinking. So the first group are who you just described. They want to be high rung. Um, and not only do they want to be high rung and that's how they think and that's how they want campus to be, but they're very brave. They're brave and they have so much integrity that it doesn't matter how scary it is. They're going to get out there and say it. And if their golem is going to punish them, so be it. They'll be, they'll make, they'll be a loud example and hopefully inspire others. Right. There's not that many of those. Again, it goes against our nature. We really want to fit in, especially when a golem's around. We all kind of want just to be in the favor of the golem. We all want to kind of suck up to it. You know, it is just human nature or at least not get in its way. But so group one, let's call it like, you know, the, the, the vocal high rungers. Now there's a big group of people who are also high rungers in the, in, at heart and maybe in their private conversations, but they're just timid. You know, they're, they're not going to risk their careers and they're just, they're not that disagreeable. They don't want to be hated. They don't want to get in fights, right? It's a lot of us. And it doesn't mean you're weak. It just means it's not your personality. For most of us, it's not. And so those people will be high rung when it's safe to do so. The first group will be high rung no matter what. The second group will be safe, high rung when it's safe to do so, when the Veritas plaque is truly running the show. Then they'll come out and speak and they'll be great members of campus. As soon as that Veritas thing comes quietly taken down and replaced by something else, they get very quiet. So that's the silent majority. Then there's a big, big, big group. Oh, so, so, well, so before we get to that, the, 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 then there's the group that is enforcing the golem stuff. These are the kind of vocal zealots, let's mm -hmm. say. These are people who they are usually in their echo chamber kind of with their friends, hating on everyone else. But as soon as the, the culture kind of gets weakened, they smell it and they will pounce and they will bully everyone. They will, they will be idea supremacists if they're allowed to be. If, if they can pull it off. Otherwise they won't, but not out of integrity, just out of uh, just out of the, the necessity because the culture is going to, they don't want to be bullied either. You know, they don't want to be laughed at. So they'll, they will be quiet. But once it's safe, they, they will be ideas. So they're the ones who are kind of pulling the strings of the golem. But I think there's a huge group um, that is, they want to be popular. Whatever's popular, they will do. If it is popular to be high rung, to say, I don't know, and to debate, and to say, we don't, I don't like echo chambers and free speech matters. They'll, they're going to be all about it. 
And the second it becomes, no, free speech is what, you know, you know, bad, you know, bad people is their excuse for things. And um, actually, these are dangerous ideas. And actually, you know, this ideology is, is right. It's not even an ideology. It's just the basic huma humanity and truth. And they're suddenly going to be full zealots with the, with the, with the, with the bullies. So that's a big group because a lot of, you know, the, and, and those people don't have much integrity, but they want to, they, they, they will do whatever's popular. So I think that the, the group of vocal zealots and the group of vocal high rungers to me are the small groups, right? These, these are not the, the much bigger groups are the kind of timid people who they know better, but they're not going to make a big fuss if everyone's being scary and the people who will jump in the popularity thing. So what happens is these other two groups are so important because when the vocal high rungers are in charge, when they can get enough power, not all now all the timid high rungers can speak out and all the people who want to be popular start acting higher rung and the, the 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 zealots are super marginalized and which is how a healthy campus should be but when something changes and we'll talk about what that something is but when something changes then it flips the balance of power and suddenly the vocal zealots are being much more vocal and actually they're being really scary and they successfully punish someone and they get someone fired a professor fired oh my god and suddenly everyone gets really quiet and oh god all the timid people get really quiet. And now the popular people can see where the wind's blowing and say, oh, these people are, uh, I want to be on there. You know, it's like the popular crowd is like the sidekick of the bully in school. So as soon as they realize, oh, this is, this is the, the popular, the new popular kid, they're going to jump over to that side. So suddenly all you have is a few vocal high rungers speaking out. And then this huge mass of other people that are all mimicking the, the bullies, the, the zealots. And it feels like everyone agrees but actually, it's still only these two little groups that actually have a strong opinion on this. So it's this very subtle human thing. And you can notice it happening. Now, what swung the balance of power? I mean, that's a long answer. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a trend that has been going on for a while in the U.S. It has a lot to do with the changes in the media landscape. And specifically and what swung the balance of power towards the vocal low runners. Yeah, toward which and then inherently burst the golems out of their... Mm -hmm fences and had them starting tramping through campus and created things, you know, totally violating the sacred oath of the, you know, the Veritas oath. Um, you know, what, why, you know, that, that was kind of the kind of things, why now, you know, what, why, yeah. you know, why, I was in college and it, it was, it was, it was a bunch of echo chamber people in their echo chambers being furious, but they couldn't do anything because that the, we're going to have debates on campus. It's a campus. Are you insane? Of course we're having debates. And the, the high run culture was strong. It stood up for itself. It's, it defended itself and, it, and, and it, it, there was there was an immune system there and now there's not it, it has failed so what is that and again it's, it's it's too long an answer to be thorough about but here are some things I think one of the major things that has to do with it is social media because what the what the the what the the intellectual bullies couldn't do the the, the would-be idea supremacists what they couldn't do when I was in college is start a smear campaign on Twitter or Facebook um and um, and they also weren't on these social media sites being pretty much indoctrinated into low rungness by the algorithms, the algorithms, not because anyone is trying to do low rungness because the algorithms want activity and attention and low rung firing up the primitive mind is a great way to do that. So al the algorithms are part of what has kind of brought the country down. A and and importantly, there's actually something else that you said when you, you were describing those four groups, right? Which is that one of the largest groups are the people that will do whatever's cool and socially credible. Yes. And on social media, we privilege and all the credit goes, the traffic, the influence, the engagement yes. goes to low rung thinking, not high rung thinking. We, 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 we talk about this all the time that there's an outrage industrial complex. Is that sort of what you're getting at? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, um, th there's a business model um, you know, I was just, I was just writing about for a totally different topic, the, you know, the industrial revolution. And it was started because the steam engine was a new invention that converted heat energy to movement, to kinetic energy. And suddenly you have all this coal that can be turned into, you know, moving cranks and factories. And it, and then in all of these, you know, all this greed came in and started innovating and saying, how can I get a piece of this? How can we build more factories and better machines? And it changed everything. But it was that spark of this new invention that created it. Social media is an engine that has found a way to convert outrage to money. And outrage, or really it converts outrage, you know, to attention and attention to money. Because it's, it's really an attention market. Uh, more attention, the more money. 
Um, and nothing, it turns out, I don't, the, early on social media, it wasn't like this. I don't, they hadn't figured it out yet. And the algorithms weren't, it hadn't really, cause there was no like button yet. You know, this is, you know, stuff that John, John Haidt talks about. Um, there was no like button. And this was, this was yet. when you were the first thousand, you know, this yeah, was, no, this but was I was the, the first OG thousand, social was, media days. It was literally like you, like, you know, friended your friends and you like looked on, you know, wrote on their walls about funny jokes from last night. I mean, it was so harmless. And Twitter was, you know, John Ronson talks about how it was a radical de-shaming platform. People uh, used to, you know, say, oh, I do this embarrassing thing. And everyone would say, me too. Ha ha. You know, you self-deprecating. And then you have the like button, you have the retweet, and and and, and suddenly it, it it caters to a different thing. And suddenly you want, you know, the, the, the posts that get people angry, you know, get a lot of likes and get a lot of followers. And suddenly it, you know, the algorithms pick up on that and they start pushing those people. And, and, and the whole thing, feedback loop, suddenly you have this thing where uh, it is rewarding. Exactly. Like you said, I think there are vocal bullies, you know, super zealots who are thriving in this environment, but that's not the majority of the big outrage creating accounts. It is people who want attention and followers and, and money and their profiteers is kind of the more um, the, the, is, is the the generalized word for it. Because like, atten you know, wanting popularity is one thing. You also could want attention. You also could want money. You also could want fame. You could want um, you could want status. But what's the what are those all have in common? Is there, there there is no integrity there because you're pretending to have to say certain things for one reason and really it's because you're profiting in this other way, right? And it's our, just it's, our, it's, our it's, colleague, our colleague Amanda Ripley. I mean, Village Square and Liz have hosted Amanda before. Talks about the conflict entrepreneurs, right? The folks that are after conflict. As totally. And here's the thing about humans: is we are, you know, if you ever had a dog and you train them, it's you know the the dog is wired a certain way. That's not changing. What you can do is change its environment. And if you give a treat, that's part of its environment, right? That's a reward that comes in, or if you give a punishment or whatever. And the 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 it's like the independent variable is sorry, the the the, the constant is the dog's wiring that you know, dog nature. And the independent variable is the environment. You know, that's the it's like the environment. Uh, the environment's like a machine. You put the, in, the, the the dog nature into the environment and out comes behavior. And the environment changes, the behavior changes, but it's the same input. So humans are the same way. Um, we are, our human nature is not changing. That's been a constant. If you have an, a high rung environment, we will act more high rung. A low rung environment, we will act more low rung. What social media is, is it's a it's an environment where you put human nature in and what comes out is incredibly low rung outrage producing machine uh, behavior. It's just that's the configuration. So something has to change about that environment. Uh, but the point is that environment changes a lot of behavior that starts to show up on campuses. Um, that's one of the many things you could say also the the traditional media landscape has totally changed. It used to be three big channels nationally broadcast. You can't alienate one tribe. You have to kind of be, you know, focused on truth. Pretty, you know, if you're not and the other ones are, you're going to be laughed out of the room. And that was a very different environment. And then you suddenly, and you know, you have cable comes out. You start to have these stations that uh, didn't need to cater to the whole country. You know, uh, you start to have talk radio, um, internet websites, and that used to, it, it was a discovery. You know, that oh, wait a second. If we, what if we stop trying to cater to the whole country and give up on that and accept that we're going to alienate half, but go super tribal with the other half and just con confirm with their beliefs instead of focusing on truth. And it turned out, I mean, look at Fox News, right? You know, look at MSNBC, these, you know, the, the look, at, look at Rush Limbaugh, right? I mean, you can just, there's so many examples of, oh, it became a huge business model. And suddenly, what does that do? That changes the environment that we live in. And that environment is going to now change our behavior and our thoughts and our, our emotions. And so and, there's and I was, a whole- and I, was, yeah. and I was actually going to ask how, when it comes to solutions, how do you build that culture? But I think you put your finger on it, which is we have to shift the environment, right? And, and it seems like, I mean, so many of the folks watching this right now, there's so many amazing leaders of different organizations. They're all building that environment. Um, we've got a ton of questions and 20 minutes. Uh, and each question, uh, we could probably spend 35 minutes on. And so you're going to hate me when I say this, which is let's try to get through as many of these questions as possible, because there's some fascinating ones. And I think they would actually follow directly where the conversation was headed. Um, if that's Perfect. good with you. So the first question, this was actually a question, Tim, I was going to ask 
when you were talking about what's happening on our campuses, but specifically when you talked about how an idea lab is not about certain confirming truths, but it's about trying to generally build this culture of disagreement, right? What that assumes is that people's physical safety, it doesn't assume, but this is a counter that a lot of people would have, that people's physical safety is tied to their ideas. We hear this idea come up a lot. And, and specifically the question we have is, you know, that this specific asker struggles with how to have a productive conversation with someone who thinks differently than they do about their humanity of historically marginalized people like LGBTQ. And I think this question comes up a lot. So how do you think about building a culture where people's identities though inherently are tied to certain ideas? Yeah, um, I, 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 I don't remember the exact source or the exact numbers here, but I, I read an amazing article about uh, a trans activist who went to one of the most like rural conservative towns and that town had been surveyed beforehand and it was like zero percent were basically like supportive of trans rights and and whatever and you know now for all there's a lot of those towns out there right now and what did they hear from the trans activists right they 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 don't hear much. I mean, they, what they hear is kind of what their tribal news tells them about, you know, and that tribal news is going to paint this in the worst way. And to the extent they do hear about it, they're going to be seeing footage of the worst, most, you know, you know, bigoted versions of those activists who really are saying nasty things about them. And it's just whatever, nothing's, you're going to stay right at 0% support. So this activist did the opposite and basically talked to them asked them questions, explained, well, here's my, here's my perspective. Here's what, here's my background. Here's how, how, here's what my life has been like. And it was this, you know, I don't know. It was, I don't, again, I don't remember the exact details. And I think it was 70% by the end were in favor of supporting this person and, 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 and had completely changed their mind in the movement. And I really think that that taps into so much here and that this idea that these people don't like they erase my identity or they don't um, they don't have any respect for the historical or the current marginalization of whatever, or they they want to take away my rights or whatever. Um, and and therefore, the right way to handle it is to either, you know, to 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 try to silence them and, and punish them if they're in my university or whatever uh, that I always, again, I always think that's wrong. Um, but then, you know, that leaves you with two options, which is ignore them entirely and just decide that you're never going to get through to them uh, and say, I, I can't talk to these people or try to get through to them the way that that activist did. And I'm not saying it's always the right thing to try to get through to them. Sometimes the answer is sometimes you have that uncle at, at Thanksgiving that there's just no way that person is so deep on the low wrongs. It's just not worth your time. There's so many higher rung people to talk to about your we ideas. We all have that uncle. Yes. But what I've noticed is that a lot of the time when someone says, oh, my, that horrible uncle I can't to talk to about politics, it is a complete question mark in my head. What's going on here? It could be that the uncle is truly a, a low rung, you know, intellectual monster and you can't talk to them and there's no way they're going to change. And they're going to make fun of you for whatever. Or maybe... That uncle has different views than you and you are the low runger because a low rung person, a low rung nephew or niece is going to think that the uncle who disagrees with them is the most awful person ever and you can't talk to them. So I think a lot of the times when we think these other people are awful, you have to be quick, careful. Are we, am I being really low rung here about them? And sometimes the answer is yes. Now, if it's not true, if you truly are, you know, you would want to talk to them in a respectful way, you want to actually hear what they have to think and 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 discuss with them and, and you know that you won't get through to them or they just have these repulsive beliefs they won't ever change, fine, then just don't talk to them. Ignore them. But shutting, but trying to say that no one's allowed to hear what they have to say, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, shout down uh uh when you know on, uh, someone who's saying those things, that is never the answer, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and and this actually gets to this general sort of cultural point, which I think a lot of organizations here are focused on. And if, there's a ton of conversation guides around there how to, about how to engage. But I think the fundamental thing that you're saying there is that that activist talked about their human empathy and connection and that human empathy allowed their experience to be relatable, which allowed there to be a real conversation. So what this inherently goes to is a question that a lot of other folks have, which is that it's very easy to attract to our low rung thinking because it's easy to spend time with people 
that agree with us. And this specific question is that a lot of people have a hard time spending time d d spending time with opposing viewpoints because it's just too painful. It just sounds like a life suck sucking experience. Um, any thoughts on that? And and do you agree or disagree with sort of how to navigate that point of human nature? I get it. I get it. I mean, when there is a really hot topic, and I have you know three text threads with three different groups of friends, and one of them is totally agrees with me. And, and I can I can send the link. And even if that link's a little bit maybe biased and maybe that's not such a really good study, but it says the right thing I agree with, that that group is going to be really friendly about it. And they're going to say, oh, totally. And they're going to thumbs up the, and heart the, the link. And then I send it to the other group. And that group is going to say, oh, come on, Tim, you're going to believe that? Like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to end up in a four hour, you know, text thing. I totally get the impulse to want to just say, you know what, I'm not talking about this with that group. I'm going to stick with, it. and that's totally human and totally fine. But you have to, you have to acknowledge what you're doing, which is that you are saying, I want to be safe in my echo chamber on this topic. I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to deal with, with disagreement. I don't want to be in an idea lab. I don't want to be in a place where these ideas are treated like experiments. I don't want to see their experiment. I don't want to hear what they have to say about mine because it's not an experiment that is, I'm treating like an experiment. I'm treating it like something more sacred than that. And I don't want to hear them disagree with it. I want to go to those people who all share the same thing. It's so human to want that. You're not a bad person. I do it. I'm sure you do it. We all do this. The only thing I would recommend is doing that with self-awareness that yes, I am choosing to be a low rung echo chamber person here because I just, my limbic system cannot handle that. And that then I think there's nothing wrong with it. I think if you're fooling yourself into thinking, I, I'm not doing it because those people are repulsive and wrong and they're, 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 you know, and, and, and it's dangerous for me to hear it or whatever, or it's, it's violence against me and I need to go to these people who are good people. No, now you're being a, an unconscious low runger and that's not good. That's an important point that the, that the distinction is, that use the, be aware about why. And as long as to your point, you're aware about why, that it's not some sort of broader, I guess you might say excuse or, or just reasoning that seems illogical focus on why, which is yeah. you just don't want to have that high. Sometimes, religion. by the way, it doesn't mean that you're, you're even a low runner if you just don't feel like arguing about politics or arguing about religion yeah. or something. I, I totally get that. Like there's so many groups where I'm just like, I, I, as someone, I see, I see a friend go to me with a certain comment and I'm like, I know I've, I could get into it and we could talk about it for four hours. And I just, I'd rather not. I'm just going to ignore it. And really, I'm just going to spend time with my kid. Yeah, totally. And also it's going to put me in this awful mood. And like, it is totally reasonable. Idea labs can be really unpleasant places. And we don't always want to you know, be an intellectual boot camp, getting smarter, getting better, searching for truth. We just sometimes just want to be happy with our ideas. But you have to then say, you know, uh, you know, it's again, if you're eating Skittles and you know, this is bad for me and I don't, I, don't, I shouldn't do it all the time, but I'm going to do it now and have a cheat day. That is so much less bad than someone who is thinking, oh, it says on the thing made with real fruit. I can have as much as this as I want. And you're being, you know, you're actually believing that it's not, that is someone who'd say, you need to, we need to talk to this person about their diet. They have a serious, like they're, they're heading down a bad path. So how do you actually identify this person's asking when one might actually be in a low rung thought pattern? How do you catch yourself? I think it's so okay. Here's um here's a graph I like to uh I I, I like to think about. So on on you have y axis is mm -hmm. conviction, how sure you are you're right. Next axis is knowledge, right? So you're here you know, you actually know a lot. You have a PhD in it, and down here you you know you, you don't know anything. And here maybe you've read a few articles, and here maybe you've you know you've you've written an article about it yourself, but you don't have a PhD. Whatever. And the, if you're being on the high rung, you don't always know stuff. In fact, as I said, you, you're often saying, I don't know, but there's a diagonal that goes right up the middle where knowledge equals conviction. That's this kind of the high rung tightrope. It's the humility sweet spot where you're just humble enough. You're the, the appropriate level of humble based on what you actually know. If you know a lot, you don't have to be humble. You say, I know what I'm talking about here, but usually you don't because knowledge is hard. So you're often going to say, I don't, you know, and you're, you're just correct, right? So what... It's hard to stand on that tightrope. Sometimes we fall below it. So below it is when you actually know more than you're giving yourself credit for. And that's when you have kind of a confidence problem. You 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 have an imposter syndrome going on and you feel like, uh, you know, insecure about your own intellect, whatever. We all have been there, but- That's really me in every you, one of these conversations, Tim. Me, me too, all the time, of course. <laughs> now, 
the the trademark of low rung thinking is drifting above that line. So that's where remember this is conviction and so, and this is knowledge. So if you're above the line, you have more conviction than you should given your knowledge. It's when I I, I think of it as kind of the arrogant zone. Um, and you're kind of a little bit full of shit. And so if you ask yourself, here's like a litmus test. If you're sure, if you feel so sure about a certain belief, there's one of two things happening. Either you really really know about that belief, or you're being a low runger who thinks you know more than you do because you're primitive mind doing the thinking. Your primitive mind, that's one of it, your primitive mind's sacred beliefs and your primitive mind identifies with it. So you you think you're sure about it, but you actually don't know. Here's the litmus test. Would you, if you're really sure about it, would you get on a stage in front of a huge group of people and, and debate someone who really knows what they're talking about, who totally disagrees with you and feel, of course I could do that. Or would you think, oh, no, 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 I, I, I couldn't do that. Okay, wait a second. Then where is this conviction coming from? It doesn't make sense. Ah, okay. So there's a lot of these litmus tests you can pull. You know, when you read something that dis here's another one. Okay, this is a John Hyde thing. When you if you have a certain belief and you read a headline or a tweet or an article that disagrees with you, are you doing some motivated reasoning where you're 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 looking you're you have a block. You're not actually going to let that article in to change your mind. You're going to say, "Must I believe this?" Or is there any reason I can find to discredit? Is that this is a bad thinker, or I don't like the way they wrote it, whatever? They, they, they don't have a, the PhD, and I'm not going to listen to them. Likewise, when you hear the article that does agree with you, are you kind of suddenly all of that skepticism about bias and who is this author goes away because you now say, Can I believe this? versus Must I believe this? So, are do you treat articles or information that conflicts or confirms your beliefs differently? Deep down, are you are you giving it the same level of skepticism? If not, there's some there's some primitive mind going on in your head is doing some of the thinking. It's so fascinating because so every Monday I, I host this podcast, right? And and it's called the Hopeful Majority. I would argue that it is kind of like an idea lab, but one of the things that oftentimes comes up in these conversations is, is that people act, especially political leaders, that seem to be exercising low rung thinking publicly. When you're actually having a one on one conversation with them. They seem to be very high rung. And 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 can you explain a little bit? And this isn't just political leaders. I think we see this all the time with TV news, you know, perception versus reality. Can you explain a little bit about this gap between the reality that we see that is, you know, high rung thinking in many places and the perception of low rung thinking everywhere? So I, I would call what you're describing performative low rungness. Okay. And it's an odd thing. Why would you? I love to... these. These sound like these sound like immune system disorders, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> you, totally. you, you have been you've been diagnosed with PDS. <laughs> it, it, it really could be a whole kind of medical field, uh, an intellectual medical field. Um, why and why would someone do performative low rungs? And by the way, I noticed the same thing. So, so okay, so a friend of mine was at a dinner or something, and they were next to Sean Hannity at the dinner, and this is not a person who is a fan of Sean Hannity. And they were so surprised. They're like, this guy's great. This guy's so like friendly and like he listens and he's charming and what? And they talked to him for a while and they actually, you know, asked him, you know, you're so different than you are on TV. And he said, yeah, I'm an, I'm an actor. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a character I play. And I think, you know, he, of course, is actually has a big show and he's on Fox News and he's expected to be a he's a very specific, very you know provocative character. OK, but I think all of us, a lot of us do this. Right. There's a character we, we play. And so politicians, media people, you know, journalists, big Twitter accounts, podcasters, whoever. Often there's a character. Now, why would you want to play a low rung character? Right. That's a bad thinker. Right. That's well, why would you want to be? hide your nuance. And, you know, if you are someone who actually is a high rank thinker, you know that that's a better way to think. That's that's more respectable. Why would you want to do that? And the answer is that and it, it's it, it, if there's, it's, you know, there's probably some kind of audience capture. It, it is, you, you're, 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 you're kind of not, integrity is not your top value here. Mm -hmm. You're choosing popularity. You're being a profiteer. And you're choosing whether you want to get elected or you want to have ratings or you want money or you want attention, whatever it is, followers, you're choosing to go for popularity over integrity and over authenticity to yourself. You're being, you're, you're down to play a character and 
the reason that that is profitable is because of the environment, you know, it's on social media or the political environment right now. You know, I talked to a, a congressman named Derek Kilmer, um, and he is the head of the New Democrats, which is the moderate Democrats. Right? And he's great. I love Derek Kilmer. I talked to him and he has so many nuanced thoughts and he wants to be bipartisan and he has he has real solutions. And he's, you know, he's the opposite of what you're talking about. And guess what? No one's heard of Derek Kilmer. <laughs> Um, if Derek Kimmel ran for president, it would be very hard to make a run for it because no one's heard of him. The, the, he has so much incentive, if, but he has integrity, which is why he continues to be that way. If you're saying my goal is not is, is, is more than integrity, I want to win the president. I want to be famous. I want to, I want to rise up. I want to you know, win the election, whatever, in a, a tribal district. Um, you're not, you can't act like that. So I think it, this, it talks about this is the environment. The environment is such where... Um, Low rungness is is profitable in these arenas, and when that's happening, you're going to see all kinds of things. Yeah, so that's where you get performative low rungness. So I actually think this is the perfect question to end on, um, which is about what we can actually do to affect that environment. So this this audience member asked the question that at the conclusion of your book, you urge the higher mind immune system to kick in by citizens being brave and speaking up and standing up and speaking up against the golems. What have you seen? in terms of tactics that are the best examples of citizen-led immune systems kicking in? How do we, in other words, create that environment that incentivizes high-rung thinking as opposed to low-rung thinking? Well, you are a great example, right? And you, know, you and, and, and the other people in this, you know, that, that you're working with here, um, you guys are out there spreading high-rungness, building high-rung spaces, where you're in charge of the culture and you don't know what's going to be said in that culture, but it's going to be high run. And, um, and so I think doing something like what you're doing is one of the many ways to do this, to actually like build high rung spaces it can be less formal than that. You can, when you're, you know, you can start to say that you're going to, you know, you're going to host dinner parties with your friends and it's going to, you're going to have a rule about high rungness and you're going to talk to everyone about how we're going to, and you're going to just train your own friend group to be better about it. You also, some people can be really brave and get out there. You know, there's, there's people on, I see them on X or on, uh, you know, um, on, on podcasts who are saying things that are high rung in this, in, in, in the face of a very, you know, a, a tribal tsunami on a certain topic. There'll be a certain topic that suddenly it's like, whoa, two golems are like, just like, it's like gladiator pit. And like, we're all just like, oh my God, this is like too huge. And you'll see that in spite of that, people, you know, on X who are just saying things that they're just getting thrashed by one of the golems. But here's the little secret is that if we were in, you know, Maoist China or Nazi Germany or so many other places in history, and you start to try to defy the golem, you're going to get killed or imprisoned for the rest of your life. Um, so that's a, that, that golem has a real cudgel in their hand. Here, the cudgel is an illusion. It's a social cudgel. It's a cultural cudgel. They can't actually hurt you right now. Now, if you work at if you work with the New Yorker and you're going to start, you know, criticizing left, you know, kind of, you know, sacred left ideas, or if you know you work at I don't know, Breitbart and you start whatever, um, yes, you might lose your job. So you couldn't get hurt if you worked at a university. You might lose your job, right? But even then, you have to ask yourself, like, is it worth it? You know, maybe I'll rest of my life will be better because I just have some, I, I I'm I feel free now. I can just be myself and I'll get a different job. But most of us aren't going to even lose their job. Most of us, actually, nothing's going to happen. You go and you do this thing that feels to our primitive minds like we're about to be ostracized for the rest of our lives. And actually, uh, nothing that bad happens. That's the truth. So I think that to, to, to look at the reality and realize that like these things seem scarier than they are and that not having integrity and not being kind of vocally who you really are and authentic to yourself is its own damage to you. So there's not that it's not that there's no cost. And the question is like, which cost matters more? And actually that cost of defying the golem is actually a, a lot less bad than it seems. And actually maybe defying your own authenticity it might be worse than it seems in the long run, you, you know, for your self-esteem. So I think and just, just having, yeah. And I think there's something very powerful there, which is that building this culture of high rung thinking, the worst case consequence is the social cudgel, which is much different than a lot of other societies. Then the physical culture where you will get shot in a fire firing squad. I mean, seriously, it's that is night and day. One is actually unbelievably scary and dangerous. And the other is kind of like, 
What am I in middle school? I can't handle some criticism. I can't handle, and by the way, who am I being criticized by? By the bullies. These aren't the people I respect. These aren't my people. You're not being, you know, so I, I think, um, I, I just think it's worth reflecting, you know, on, 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 on the actual environment. Remember, the primitive mind thinks Skittles are healthy. The higher mind can see that they're not. The primitive mind thinks this is scarier than it is. Because in, in his world, if you get kicked out of your tribe and ostracized, you're going to starve. The higher mind can see that it's not. So look at it with your higher mind and say, I actually don't think that this is as scary as everyone thinks it is. I'm just going to start being myself. And you, the sky probably won't fall. So in the last five minutes, audience do not run yet because this conversation has been fascinating. We're building a community of high rung uh, thinkers, I would say. And I think, as you said, a lot of the amazing organizations watching this, doing the work are building that culture. So I've got one last question for you. This is a Liz Joyner special. Uh, and again, a huge thank you to the Village Square and Florida Humanities and Liz for hosting these amazing programs and the team that put together the work in the back end. You and I just get to talk, but there's amazing people doing this work. So before I ask this last question, we actually have a survey that we'd love for you to fill out and there'll be an, a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Talk about incentivizing a culture of high rung thinking people. It's a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. If you check out the survey that just got dropped in the chat. And while you're filling out the survey, um, we're going to drop a couple other links. We're going to drop a link to uh, Tim's Ted talk. If you haven't already watched it, I was actually a college sophomore when I watched that Ted talk, I was one of 73 million that was procrastinating, uh, watching your, your Ted talk, which I think is the biggest irony of it. Um, yeah. you can also learn more about Tim's blog. Wait, but why that link is about to be dropped in the chat. You can also buy the book. Um, and finally every Monday I host conversations, exactly this on the hopeful majority podcast. And part of the reason why it's called the hopeful majority is because I think again, to your point, Tim, there's a new divide and that divide is not about what we think it's about how we think. Um, so with that, Here's the final question from your book. I've got a passage. I've been using a little mantra when I'm down on the low rungs and I have a moment of self-awareness where I realize I'm on the low rungs. I say in my head, climb. It's not a scolding moment. It's a moment of self-compassion. I'm doing that thing every human does sometimes. It's okay. I caught myself. Climb. Talk to us about climbing. You know, when you meditate, what do they always say? They always say, oh, you notice your mind drifting, which it will. It's okay. Just notice it and gently bring it back, right? <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's like that. This is something where we all do this. We, the, the, we all have a limbic system or you wouldn't be alive, right? This, this primitive mind is not going anywhere. Very active in our heads. And sometimes it's going to just get the best of us. Right, just like your mind's gonna run in when you're trying to meditate. This is literally like we have no choice about this kind of thing, but we can be more or less self-aware. And if you, you know, when you're meditating, you know that the mind running is the thing that you're trying to catch and bring it back. If you don't know that, you're just gonna think for the time you're meditating. You're not actually gonna meditate, right? So you can't do that until you understand even the game. So what I would kind of call on people to do here is not to be perfect high rung thinkers, you're never gonna do that, um, is to just have the game even in your mind, the game of, I wanna, I wanna be high on this. I wanna, uh, next year, I want my total minutes where I was kind of up on the high rungs to my total minutes on the low rungs ratio to be a little bit better than it was this year, right? I'm not gonna be perfect, but I wanna get a little bit better. It's training, like meditation, you're training your mind. So when you catch yourself, uh, like, like, you know, you know, I, I realize that I, I have too much conviction on this thing. I couldn't debate anyone and I act like I could. Ah, okay. I'm not, don't, you know, there's no shame. I'm being a human. Yep. Okay. Climb. Just stop with that conviction because it doesn't, it's not earned and it doesn't make sense. And if you just do that and you have that game in your head, you have to know the game to even play to start getting good at it. So just, if you can have that game, it's amazing how you can improve and how many, by the way, so much pain goes away. There's so many times when I'm bitter at my friend who's arguing with me or I'm, I read a tweet and I'm so angry, I'm scrolling and I'm angry. This has helped me say, mm, ah, it's primitive mind is going, is for no reason and makes no sense. The primitive mind is all worked up. It just takes all the power away. And I suddenly I laugh about it and I move on. So I think it's very, it's an empowering thing. It's good for us. It helps us be happier people as well as, as better thinkers. Well, believe it or not, actually, Tim, I think, I mean, I think that at this moment, the high rung thinking is so especially important, not even because, I mean, it's important to have that thinking, but I think it actually shapes people's minds in realizing that there's a new divide. 
And I think people are looking for hope around rallying around a new way of approaching our politics, our church life, our religious life, our community life, our friends life. And I I'm surprised you didn't actually push back on this, but I think a lot of people listening to this would, would agree with you. Honestly, talking to people you disagree with is not a life-sucking experience. It's actually, in many ways, one of the most dopamine-inducing things you could do. Oh, yeah. Oh, idea labs are great. I mean, it's, it's again, if it's the, it, the key is that if it's, an, if it's a high-rung culture, then it's fun. Because then you say something and say, no, 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 you're being biased because of this. And you say, oh, I don't think I'm, and you're having fun. You're playing with each other. What, what makes it unfun is echo chamber culture is when you disagree and people get personal and they get nasty and give a low blow and they, and they, and they insult you or they're mad at you. I mean, right. So if it's not fun, look at the culture and ask why, uh, and, and, and know that it should be fun. And then also ask who is exactly inflicting this culture? Is it all of us? Or is there one person maybe that is kind of imposing this? And when they're not there, it's a lot less like that. Ask that question and, you know, have that awareness. And, and maybe you it's you, by else? the way. And, 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 and to your point, you know where else this question is being asked? Actually, Liz, believe it or not, if you're in Tallahassee next Tuesday, um, Liz in the Village Square actually hosting and starting a What's Our Problem book club at the Hummingbird Wine Bar. Space is limited, so you just got to email Liz at villagesquare.us. Again, a group of people that are trying to push a high-rung thinking mindset in an environment where, to your point, people are craving this work. And if you're out of town, you can email Liz, and we'll actually, they'll send over a digital book and uh, there's a hard copy version coming out soon. So uh, promo that as well, that people can check out that's happening. And that's also dropped in the chat. And I just want to again say that, you know, on behalf of all the young people at Bridge USA doing this work on behalf of Florida Humanities, the Village Square, the rest of the amazing streaming partners, um, thank you to the audience for joining. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And, and importantly, Tim, uh, thank you for your time and your work on this. Uh, let's go fight the golems. Yeah. And thank you for having me on and for all the great questions and for, uh, you know, for doing what you're doing. Cause I wrote the book and then I'm, you know, that was what I did. You're continuing this. You're, con you're, you're just doing this all the time and that's, we need more of that. And so I'm grateful to you. Onwards and upwards. Good night, everybody. <laughs>